what made you or what was the inspiration for you to get into um, eating disorders and the treatment of it? Well, so kind of taking a step further, I, so I got into my profession based on my family history of heart disease. Everyone hereditarily has high cholesterol and or heart disease. And the time my dad was alive and just growing up, always hearing about, you know, high cholesterol and his heart. That's how I became interested in the field. And when I was in college, so I first started out at Sonoma State in Northern California. And, and, you know, truthfully, I was that personality that always had the horse blinders on and was focused on my tennis and, you know, really knew nothing about eating disorders as, you know, I learned later, my three roommates all struggled with bulimia nervosa. So I would fall asleep at night to them purging. And I was basically on a different schedule than I would say, like all the students I knew because I always had to wait games for my tennis matches. And, and so that's when I just was like, oh, okay. I, you know, heard something. And I remember um, at breakfast, you know, a bunch of weeks later, one of them just wanted to kind of share with me her quote unquote secret. And that was just where I, you know, learned about it on a peripheral basis. <clears throat> and then when I graduated and then I went to Virginia, I worked at Cedar sinai Medical Center. I was there for five years prior to starting my practice, actually. Next Thursday, I was just telling my husband, I'm like, or excuse me, this Thursday, April 7th, is 25 years that I've had my practice. And wow, congrats. Uh, thank you. Yes, big milestone. And so I remember when I worked at Cedar sinai Medical Center, the chief dietitian had asked who was interested in seeing this individual who was admitted with an eating disorder. And I always like to say, Allie, that I learned about eating disorders backwards and meaning like in the real world, you know, it's pretty rare that someone will be tied down by restraints and, you know, mm -hmm. the tube feeding, which is very archaic. And anyways, I knew, you know, I had said, okay, I'll see this person because I was a whiz at, you know, doing what's called enteral feedings, which was what a tube feeding is back then. And essentially realized like I need to learn how to work with these folks and, you know, have been trained by the best in the industry. So that was how I became interested. And now what are the most common eating disorders? Well, the most common or the most spoken about? Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you both. So actually the most common, it's not discussed enough is binge eating disorder. Okay. So actually like one out of four individuals who diet develop an eating disorder and binge eating disorder for individuals that have eating disorders, 60% of women struggle with it and 40% of men. So, you know, we hear more about anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa and compulsive exercise and there's what's called ARFED, which is avoid and restricted food intake disorder. But I always like to say, you can't look at someone and determine if they have an eating disorder based on their age, their body shape and size, or, or, you know, their appearance. So binge eating disorder is actually the most common, but the least spoken about. Oh, wow. Interesting. So would you consider binge eating bulimia? No. So they're different. So binge eating is eating a concentrated amount of food in a short period of time and keeping it down. Bulimia nervosa is engaging in self-destructive behaviors to get rid of it, whether it be purging via vomiting, purging right. via laxatives, diuretics, purging via exercise. There's diabulimia, type one diabetics that oh, wow. skip their doses of insulin the purge because insulin can make you hungry. Yeah. So it's, it's a way to dispose of what's been consumed. Got it. Okay. Yeah. That's <laughs> definitely a new term that I don't even know. When I, sure. You know, well, the term you might be familiar with Allie or if not the term seeing is orthorexia nervosa. Are you familiar with that? Mm -mm. I may have seen it or, you know, whether well, when I was I, let me describe it and you're going to be like, oh yeah, I know so many people. This is, I would say very common. And I feel like since COVID has really escalated, especially with the younger clients I see. So orthorexia nervosa is the obsession to eat healthy. It's taking health to an uber unhealthy place. It has to be organic, has to be raw, it has to be vegan, it has to be paleo. And where the individual is not able to eat out in the world unless it falls into these rigid parameters. Got it. 
Okay. That's You're bombarded with it as I am. It's like everywhere. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I'm sure. Um, I'm a healthy eater, but I don't, I don't think I go to that extent at all. Yeah. I mean, it's so where a person, a person is not able to eat out unless something falls into yeah. a specific criteria. Or I remember having a session, this is before COVID and I was sitting with my client and he was like 10 and he had asked his mom, oh, went to the waiting room and was like, oh, mom, you know, what do you have I can eat? And she named all the things. And um, he's like, don't you have grapes? She's like, I didn't buy the grapes. They're not organic. And he's like, but I want the grapes. I don't want any of these things. So I think too, oftentimes a lot mm -hmm. of the eating disorders, especially with the kids, they learn from their parents that haven't resolved their own issues with food in their body. Right. And I think that's with anyone, I mean, with their parents and sure. how they've been raised up. I mean, yes. raised. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So what is your belief about people developing an eating disorder and kind of like the root of it? Um, yeah. Well, sometimes it could be trauma related. Mm -hmm. I think even like the last two years, I mean, everyone has been living trauma, it's a different kind mm -hmm. of trauma, but for some it's been a means of survival, whether mm -hmm. They have been abused. They've had difficult times in their life. It has served a purpose or it wouldn't be a behavior that they would engage in. I mean, some, it's like, we look at our genetics and mm -hmm. it's like, okay, we can't change our genes. There's certain parts. It could be genetic where it's like, oh, well, my mother and my sister, my aunt, they all had eating disorders. So, I mean, there could be a genetic piece too. Of course. And I, and I think, you know, sometimes it's just like the messages we pick up in society through diet culture, through healthcare providers, through, you know, people we know, educators, it's like we're bombarded with these messages. So I would say trauma, genetic, and just what we absorb in society. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think society really dictates a lot. And I think it also is, I mean, New York city, it's a competitive culture. So, I mean, go figure. I mean, everyone's got to be, you know, this thin, you know, to be accepted. And right. I, I don't think we need to go into it. I think you totally, I mean, obviously you understand it's yeah, it's, it's a crazy culture we live in. And obviously yeah. it's, well, I think large cities, whether it's New York or Los Angeles or San Francisco, I feel like there's, yeah. you know, similar messages. Yes. Yeah. Um, so is there diversity among who gets eating disorders versus not? Um, and I'm not even just talking about like hereditary genetic conditions, but even those like with different ethnicities. hundred percent. Um, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I was just having a conversation with two colleagues of mine that are going to be on my podcast that have written a book on, you know, black women with eating disorders. And oh, wow. I think, you know, marginalized voices are not spoken about as much. And, you know, when you talk about, I mean, there's a lack of diversity in the field, especially in my field. Like, unfortunately, you know, now there's a group that's called diversity in dietetics, but I would say even just starting out earlier in, in my career, and I see how it's changed, but it's really been slow. The field seems to attract smaller bodied Caucasian women with thin privilege that are cisgender and <clears throat> to be able to have, you know, thinking about like who gets it. I mean, there's an actually I have to show you in my office. I actually have a, this poster written by a, you know, a colleague who is in the Latina and it's like, there, there's so many types of individuals that have eating disorders and they're not discussed as much. So there can be, you know, non-gender affirming. Yeah. I have a couple transgender clients in my practice. Of course, males, males have the same struggles that women do. Women, but I mean, there can be individuals that are people of color, different um, ethnicities. It's, mm -hmm. it's everywhere. No one's immune to developing any disorder. Got it. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about your podcast and book, The Eating Disorders Trap? Cool. Yeah. So The Eating Disorder Trap and The Eating Disorder Trap podcast. So the podcast evolved when 
my book signings did not happen because of COVID. <laughs> my book ah. came out the week before the world shut down. So March, March 30th, two years ago. Right. And so the book, as you and I were discussing before, I really wanted to write something that was different in my field that can encompass all that you don't have to be an expert in the field, but also it could be helpful for a parent, a teacher, a, a coach, a priest, a rabbi, I mean, anyone where it's not so advanced with the terminology. So I think to be able to, you know, have the you know, I four sections in it, basically understanding like symptoms that are not so obvious and how a person can help and certainly really understanding like what's going through an individual's mind who is struggling. I think that's really important. The dietitian's role, because a lot of people don't understand what an eating disorder dietitian does. They think of what, what I would call a traditional dietitian. And, you know, that's oftentimes, you know, contributing to the problem, the information that a, what's called a weight normative dietitian is providing people that have disordered eating or eating disorders don't need information about serving size and calories. It's like they can dictate that as well. It's about creating a new relationship with food and their body and learning how to honor what their body is telling them that it needs, as well as learning how to embrace the different levels of hunger and the different levels of fullness and not be afraid of any food or food group or have feelings of guilt or shame or remorse when they're honoring a, a craving. Sometimes we just want to have them thinking, because you're in New York, my favorite thing is like, I love bagels. Can I ask Judith, when I saw Judith the last time I was there, I was like, I would love my H&H &H bagel. And we had lunch and I've got my bagel. So it's, mm -hmm. it's like nice to be able to have these things. It's nice to be able to say, you know what? I want to have M&Ms with my meal. I'm really not feeling it for an apple. And, and you know, that's what makes the world go around is having different preferences and, and cravings. So in the book, I actually debunk the myths about, you know, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, you know, water, because a person can overconsume fluid and really getting into how to create your team and what a team consists of, mm -hmm. but also really understanding all the complications that one's body goes through, because there's not one body part that is spared by having an eating disorder. So really getting into what we call the eating disorder voice, the voice of mm -hmm. Ed or, mm -hmm. you know, Edwina, and really understanding that as, as well as looking at how that voice has served a purpose, or it wouldn't be a behavior that a person would engage in. So my book is, as many have said in, in the field, it's like a mini encyclopedia. I've kind of merged a bunch of topics in a smaller size book. And then my podcast which July will be two years Congrats. developed when the book tour didn't happen. And I had decided, Allie, you know what? I wanted to have a podcast that isn't just all the usual eating disorder providers that are on a lot of the podcasts. So I have, you know, really my topics can, you know, be helpful for a non-clinician. It can be helpful yeah. for a parent. It can be for clinicians. So I have a lot of interesting topics in each episodes 15 to 25 minutes and yeah it's going going great I'm about to take a break from it I've I've actually as of next week my episodes will be done through January oh wow so so you have, <laughs> okay so I mean do you have you have a ton of episodes through January of next year yes yeah okay I've um, always been I'm just that's me I've always been a planner no that's okay I'm a <laughs> planner too I've done so many interviews now it's gotten it's now gotten to a point where now it's like we're at a good balance. But in the beginning, because of the pandemic, yeah. I so inter so many interviews like left and right, because also like what else were we doing? And yeah. um I, I there was such a big backlog that my team was like, Ali, you have to stop doing interviews for like a few months. Wow, good for you. So you did a lot. Yeah, so I did a lot. So I can resonate with you. So, anyways. Now I'm starting them up slowly. So, but, nice. um, but that's great. Um, but no, I'm glad that the book and then the supplementary of the podcast. And then the so other cool. thing I'll just mention too, I created an online course with my colleague. It's called your recovery recourse, your cut, your recovery resource. It's an online course for parents and partners and caregivers that have a loved one struggling with an eating disorder. So that went live about a month ago. We're kind of looking at what the next step is 
with that. So, you know, we're trying to kind of figure out the secret sauce of marketing it online because there's not as many resources for parents and loved ones as much as there are for providers. So, oh, right. exactly. so that, that was a labor of love over the last bunch of months. And it's, you know, created by an eating disorder therapist, my colleague, Becca Clegg, who's in Atlanta, me, and we have over four decades of experience. So really from understanding insurance to low fee groups to how a parent or partner really can work on themselves. Cause that's oftentimes a missing piece. They're aware that their loved one is in treatment and is in therapy, but it's like their role in this mm-hmm. too. So we have videos, we have worksheets, we have, I mean, nice. we have a number of colleagues, you have to go through it. You know, Judith was one of them and really being able to, to have that. So we're just working on pushing that now too. That's great. Oh, I'm excited to hear more about it. Uh, so what is the non-diet approach? So a non-diet approach is basically helping a person learn how to honor and pay attention to what their body is craving. So if you think of an intuitive eater, <clears throat> all babies and children were born and blessed with this internal wisdom to be able to eat when they are hungry, stop when they're satisfied. We're not focused on having feelings of guilt or shame or questioning what they're eating or why they're eating or how much they're eating. And slowly through the aging process, we become more and more disconnected from being able to pay attention to what our body's telling us. So being a a non-diet provider is helping someone establish food freedom and flexibility and pleasure in eating. Cause I believe eating can and should be a pleasurable experience. And when an individual is learning how to eat for the proper reasons, their body will be where it's naturally going to be at for them at whatever stage in life they're at. That's, that, that's a great way to say it. Cause I don't think, um, I don't think people think of it like that. Um, totally. Especially yeah. cause that's the opposite message of what society tells us. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why you're in your profession and what you're doing. So, <laughs> um, all right. So there are many images surrounding um, unrealistically thin or fit men and women, um, but it seems that not everyone is as susceptible to negative um, self-comparisons. Why do you think this is so? Why, why do I think some people aren't susceptible to comparisons? Yeah, like why do you think that some people are susceptible to all of these, you know, negative yeah. conceptions of like, you know, people and then some people are not. So like, you know. Well, I think it really comes down to your values and your confidence within yourself. I know, especially over COVID with, the college students I see, the teenagers I see, it has enhanced the comparing of what my friends are eating, what's what are my parents eating, what they're not eating, look at how their body looks. There's so much comparing and what's called body checking. And I think a person that's really at peace with themselves doesn't care mm-hmm. what you are eating or how much or how little it's like, we all come in different shapes and sizes. And I would never ask a chihuahua to look like a pit bull. It's like, these are our genetics. So much of this is dictated by our genetics. In fact, when we're babies, when we're born, it's already predetermined what our body will look like as we age. So if a person's having to go through unnatural extreme measures to change their body, then it's probably not the place where they're just naturally meant to be. Right. So I think so much has to do with your values and your beliefs within yourself and how you feel about yourself. Very interesting. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's interesting from an outsider to think that way. Um, but I would agree. Well, I think the more insecure that a person is, the more they're comparing themselves to others. And it's Absolutely. really developing a foundation of being confident within yourself and not caring what this person is or is not eating or how much or how little too. Yeah. I actually, and this is 
a personal side note, but one of my best friends is a dietitian and she became a registered dietitian. Um, and she became a dietitian, um, as a result of her family or family history of eating disorders. And so she has struggled with her weight. I mean, no, 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 she's totally fine. She's not obese or anything, but you know, she's well, the term we like to use in my field is a larger body. It's yeah. Okay. Right. So we'll get into that. Like, so she, like, <laughs> it's stigmatizing to call body. someone quote unquote, obese. I mean, there's people that identify as like, oh, I'm a fat dietitian and they embrace that and they love it. But I think a lot of that kind of stems from the messages we hear in healthcare too. Right. Um, but no, she's very susceptible. So I was just going to say like, she, I was, I was visiting her in Texas this past fall. Um, and you know, I was going to put, I posted a photo of us And I mean, my mom would say it was not a great photo of her, but it wasn't the end of the world, but she got very upset because it was, oh no, this is like who I am. This is like, and I right. It's like, apologize, but yeah, exactly. So just, you know, tailing off, you know, what we were just talking about. It's, um, yeah, it's out there. I see it too. Yeah. Um, so what does the role of like body dysmorphia play, which is a disturbed image of someone's body? Well, I would say actually, as you're bringing that up, the thing that's coming up big time now with clients is body dysmorphia with their faces. The kids at school, they're not wearing a mask. People haven't seen me without a mask. I haven't been seen... In two years, I've skipped grades. I haven't seen friends and how my face looks, how my nose looks, how my ears look, how my lips are, my cheeks. It's like, so when you mentioned, you know, really body dysmorphia is the fixation on a specific body part, but I think removing the mask, this is like real and it perpetually increases the anxiety that ones are, you know, ones experiencing. Do you consider it like a symptom or you just think it's, kind of a symptom of what a symptom of like you know well I guess a symptom of an eating disorder or Not necessarily there's okay. people that don't have eating disorders that are just fixated on it's like look we've been in a mask for too long and I mean look I I, I saw I saw my body worker Sunday she's you've never seen me without a mask right but no, I, I, it's like, I feel like it's like a part of her face. Right. It's, I guess it's, it's strange. It's, it's different if you had existing relationships with people before, but yeah, it's, it's um totally different. No, you're right. And I guess it's, it's now more prevalent because of the hundred percent. Yes. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I never really thought about it, but now, I mean, it's like how like therapists don't want to see their no, I mean, not all therapists want to see their patients inside if they're not comfortable yet, because they don't want to be like, you know, have them wearing a mask to see their like facial. Ex- so they well, I think we've done a pretty good job with being able to read from like here up. Of course. I mean, you know, it's like out of all my clients today, two are in person, but I mask their masks and my front doors are open and my windows are open. I mean, I'm just being safe especially the next few weeks. Cause I'm going to go out of the country and I'm just like, okay, let's just, you know, be masked, but I have no problem seeing vaccinated. Right. No, I mean, most of the people I work with that they're all like, you know, doesn't matter like whatsoever, but yes. um, I know some people are still sticklers. So yes. um, I was, you know, I was just saying, I mean, to each its own, I guess I should sure. say, you know? Um, So I know you speak about this clearly a lot in your book. Um, but for anyone that's watching and just would love, um, a tip or a piece of advice, what is one thing that you would tell like a family member or caregiver, um, in helping support someone they know that has an eating disorder? First tell a caregiver or parent not to share, well, this is what I do. This is what works for me. That is not helpful. Right. Ask the individual who's struggling. How can I support you? How can I help you? Do you, you know, feel like you want someone to speak to? I mean, it really, it's sometimes an individual doesn't know because they're so deep in it. But I think as a parent partner to be able to say, I'm always here for you to speak and listen and removing judgment, biases, nonverbal 
cues can be just as harmful as verbal, but really not sharing like, well, this is what I eat and this is what works for me. This is what I do. That is probably the most problematic response. And I know it's coming from a place of love, but it's actually exacerbating the eating disorder. Correct. Because it's not about you. It's about them. Right. Absolutely. Makes sense. Um, so what do you envision, you know, in the next 10, 20 years, you know, the eating disorder, like world to be, I mean, do you, I mean, do you envision hopefully that, I mean, there's no necessarily cure, (laughs) um, but some type of, um, like better treatments, you know, than are currently out there, whether it even be like an oral like pill or pharmaceutical. I don't even know exactly. Pill I mean, wouldn't even do it. I mean, what I'm, I envision and what I hope, um, I mean, the ideal, it would be great if every insurance company okay. had a trained team of eating disorder providers, of eating disorder physician, dietitian, therapists, that when the utilization reviews are happening, when people are in treatment, that there are knowledgeable, informed providers that can assess it versus people being terminated. Really, that is my like wish, because the insurance—that's a whole other mess. I think there will be more and more. It's happening now. <clears throat> um, virtual programs—you could be in any remote location and have access to a team twenty-four-seven. That's like happening mm-hmm. now. I have a colleague that started this, and I think there'll be more and more of that. Sadly, I think the numbers are just going to continue to rise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my other like wish list is that all providers removed scales out of their office because that just exacerbates and increases the rage of the eating disorder voice, unless it was something called my clear step. I'm a my clear step provider. It's the first HIPAA compliant numberless scale. So like when someone stands on it, all their information comes in my computer. It's a fully blank face. And because providers are oftentimes doing harm because they're not trained, which is why I wrote my book. And yeah, so those are, those are just a few of my wishes and hopes and what I see happening. You know, I can't predict the future, but well, no one no. can. I mean, <laughs> right? Who exactly. knows what's going to happen in you know another year? Yeah. So, yes, um, it's uh, it's definitely like a tricky um, balance. And so, I guess lastly, since we spoke about this, we didn't really get into it. Um, the language that people use. So, you like to use um, language. There's people. There's yeah. There's people with what's called like I have what's called thin privilege. There's Yeah. So there's people and it's taken years, Allie, to like learn these terms Mm -hmm. because, you know, this was not in my training. It's literally cultivated in the last bunch of years. There's people in larger bodies. There's people in smaller bodies. You know, it's, it's like, you know, you would never say, Allie, how come you don't like every food I like? Like that's what makes us different and unique. We all come in different shapes and sizes. We all have different preferences. And when we use the term, quote unquote, obese or fat, unless a person is like claiming, like I have colleagues like that are saying, oh, you know, I'm the fat therapist, I'm a fat dietitian. And that's how they brand themselves, how they speak about them. I mean, I, I know people, it's like their necklaces say, you know, fat positive, I'm a fat. You know, oh, yeah, no, that's, but, but, yeah. you know, to speak about it freely and to be able to say, it's not the same thing as saying like she has brown hair and brown eyes. It It's very, offensive and stigmatizing so to be able to say there's people that live in bigger bodies or there's people that live in smaller bodies and having the privilege of being it's like yeah my lived experience is different from someone else's lived experience and to be able to empathize and understand that yeah absolutely well now i'm going to go around and say somebody who lives in a thinner body versus a larger body personally actually my mother struggles smaller body smaller body smaller oh not thinner smaller yes oh okay well i'll tell that to my mom because she struggles a little bit with eating um she's fine but she's (laughs) totally like smaller body person our bodies are not meant to remain the same as we age they're always changing 
That's true. And she's 69. So go figure. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You know, each year of life, let alone each decade of life, our bodies change. Change. Yeah, that's the evolution of humanity. Yeah. So it's crazy. Well, this we has get- been so much fun. 